Hi, I'm Landon Whitsitt. Welcome back to Theocademy and the third lesson in our series on the foundations of Presbyterian discipleship. I have a secret for you. Presbyterians are Christians. Now I know that may sound like a silly and self-evident statement to make, but it, it's actually not. To say that Presbyterians are Christians means that Presbyterians follow Jesus Christ. We are not just a group of generically religious people. Presbyterians are a people who claim that it is our job to follow a very particular person and do what he has taught us. After we promise to turn from sin and renounce evil, the second question that all new members of a Presbyterian church are asked to answer is this. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? We are asked to name Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and the act of naming is very important. We know this. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what to name people and things. People spend a lot of time trying to figure out the name of a child. If two people choose to live a covenant life together, they have to make a decision about whether or not they're going to have the same last name. Growing up, I was told that I had to call my pastor by the name Pastor Rick. However, when I was a pastor in a congregation, I always wanted congregation members to just call me Landon. When it comes to naming, using the right words is very important. I think our words are so powerful. And reading through the Old Testament, you recognize this when people are speaking of, about God. Naming meant to have ownership over something. And so this is why the Old Testament story writers are so careful not to name God, um, to, to refer to God in, in, in many ways, a more general sense. The name of God is something never spoken. So there, there is great power in our words. Part of the reason the people of God have always been careful with what we say is because our scriptural stories are full of times when words and names have literally brought things into being. In Genesis, we claim that God created by speaking life into existence. God said it, and it was. God didn't go to a workshop. God didn't draw up blueprints. God not only spoke the world into being, God used words to change the course of people's lives. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a number of examples of, of God naming, renaming. One of my favorites uh, is of Jacob wrestling all night with this being that he can't, he can't quite understand. And at the end of this night of wrestling, uh, God gives him a new name, sort of, sort of al cl allowing him to claim who he is. You know, his past isn't great. <laughs> uh, what brought him to that place is, is not a great story of, of necessarily heroism. But what God says is, claim who you are. And it is not only God's speaking that we find to be powerful in the Bible. People speak too. People name things too. Throughout the scriptures, people gave special names to special places. Jacob used the name Bethel, which means house of God, because it was in that place that God had come to him. And in one instance, someone actually got to name God. Another great story um, is kind of the other way, is with Hagar. As, as she is running from, from the abuse and she meets God and uh, such a powerful moment where she names God and says, you are El Roy, the God who sees me. No one else saw her. I think it's so important to say that. Uh, in her life, she was nameless in many ways and yet God allowed her uh, to name uh, this this divine being, and, and she's shocked by that. You see me, and I am still alive. Um, I, I think that's a powerful powerful moment of what it means to uh, to to speak and to to recognize that um, uh, the power of our words and of our naming things into being. You see me, and I am still alive. Hagar saw God and named God. 
and she was still alive. Hagar's encounter with God was a a powerful moment in human history. She needed someone to see her and save her. That someone came to her, so she named God as such. We also need someone to see us and to save us. It's one thing to say that we are willing to turn from sin and, and renounce evil in the world, but that's not something that we can do all on our own. Presbyterians have always acknowledged that we have a particular propensity to just mess things up. If left to our own devices, we will continue to make the small kinds of choices that lead to great, big, terrible realities. We need someone to give us a way out of that horrible cycle. In the Old Testament, the people longed for someone to lead them out of the tyranny, oppression, and hatred they both endured and inflicted on one another. And they called this person that would come and change everything the Messiah. In Mark, when Jesus asks Peter who he thinks Jesus is, that's the name that Peter uses. You are the Messiah, the one who has come to save us. So the idea of of a Messiah for the New Testament um, people was not uncommon. They were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for someone to come and to turn things around, to to save them from uh, a a life of of persecution and oppression and and real uncertainty. This would have been known. Peter would have known the story of our Old Testament prophets um, where we, we hear about a Messiah coming. And watching Jesus, Jesus was speaking to all of that history. They're recognizing that he is not like all of the other people who are running around saying they're the Messiah. What what he is saying is really coming into being. And, and so as, as, as Peter is saying that, he is, you know, having this, this recognition. Jesus is the Messiah. That claim changed the world, and it's the claim that we are asked to make. Lord and Savior are admittedly weird words to our modern ears, especially for those of us who live in the United States. We don't really have a a functional understanding of what a Lord is. Sure, we can read about lords and ladies in the history books, but but we have always been a a free and self-governed people. But we are still asked to use these same ancient words. So what are we really saying when we call Jesus our Lord and Savior? I I actually, in the last year, have had somebody come to me and and ask this very question. And, And she said, I just don't think I can... I can rightfully answer that question. Often, uh, we just want to say, just answer the question and everything else will come into place. <laughs> I think as, as pastors, sometimes we just want to say, just say the words. I was so blessed, frankly, by this person coming to me and say, saying, I, I can't just say the words. I, I need to know what I'm saying. And I'm not sure. She she said, I can get on board with everything else. I love this community. I believe in God. I, I want to, uh, I want to follow Jesus. But I don't know that I can say that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I wish I could say that I gave her a very concise answer. And then the next Sunday, she said those words and joined the church. But of course, the end of the story is that, um, that, that she wasn't able to. What I shared with her was that saying that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, renouncing uh, sin and its power, says we live in a new world because of this person that came to us. We live in a world where we are still afraid, but... It doesn't have to take over our lives because someone came for us. And not just someone, but God came for us in this person that we call Jesus to to change everything for us. In the end, this is why we can say yes to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God has not just left us alone to make little choices that add up to big messes. 
God chose to be with us in this mess. And not just be with us, but to lead us out of it. To provide a way to be the people that we have been called and created to be. To confidently name Jesus as our Lord and Savior is to draw upon the power of those words and to trust that God is who God has claimed to be. We'll see you next time.